you for coming. I thought we should get going because it's hot even here. You guys probably want to stay all night. Uh, mm -hmm. First reminder as usual, for those of you who haven't been here or forgotten, the store closes at 8. We must buy all books by 8 o'clock. I know this sounds like a broken record, but we did Terry Brooks here last week. And I had four different people walk up and go, what? The store's closed? Mm -hmm. And I had to try and deal with that. Okay. Um, it's really kind of difficult to do. So please buy your books by 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I will remind you that uh, next Wednesday, Joe Abercrombie will be here on the 23rd. What? Uh, Tobias, I can't talk. Tobias Bakel will be here on the 28th on Monday. And most of you guys won't be here, but Rochelle Mead will be here on the 29th, so you guys will be downtown probably. Mm -hmm. And August 4th, Robin Hobb is here, especially with her new book. August 11th, Kat Richardson is here. August 12th, Patrick Swenson is launching his first novel here, so tell your friends, because no one comes, Patrick is going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> I read a really big pile of that book. So. Other than that, I'm going to just let the folks from Clara wants to take over. Please welcome Felicia. Thank you, Dwayne. Great. Thank you. And thank you all for coming in from the um, beautiful evening out there. Tonight is the fourth in the Clarion West Summer Reading Series. And as you know, this evening we're featuring the amazing Hiro Mogoto. I have the pleasure of volunteering with the Clarion West Board, and I just want to share a few um, bits of information with you before turning things over to the reading. Most of you know that Clarion West is a nonprofit. We work on forging new voices in science fiction and fantasy by providing exceptional educational opportunities to writers at the beginning of their careers. That's really critical to getting new voices out there. For the last 30 years, our Cornerstone program has been a six-week summer workshop, and each of those weeks has been helmed by a master practitioner, such as Hiromi. We couldn't do our work without very generous supporters, and I just want to take a second here to acknowledge Ford Culture, Amazon, the National Endowment for the Arts, University Bookstore, who's been a longtime partner of ours, and also the many generous individuals who support, support, their critical support, right? Not only are vital to the work of the workshop, but to readings like this one tonight. So it's all one, hopefully, one seamless um, support network. And our largest fundraiser is happening right now. How many of you are participating in the write-a-thon? Show of hands. Uh, keep your hands up. How many in this room are supporting the write a as a sponsor? Raise those hands. Okay, so that means there is room for more people to participate. Um, as I mentioned, the write a is our largest fundraising event. It's also a vehicle that allows writers to do what they do best, which is write. You can go on to the Clarion West website clarionwest.org takes less than three minutes to sponsor a writer. I know for a fact, because I did it last night, it's been improved over last year's website. You can read amazing work and right away begin supporting those new voices. So take a minute after tonight, after you've bought your books, after you've enjoyed Hiromi's read, and make sure other voices get out into the universe. I want to remind you, as Dwayne mentioned, after the reading, get your books because the, work, the bookstore will close up at 8 o'clock and we don't want anybody disappointed who can't get their work. If you have any devices that beep, bleep, or will otherwise compete with the reading, please silence those now and keep them hushed for the duration. Next Tuesday, join us here for Charlie Jane Anders. And then the final reading is on July 29th at the Downtown Library with John Crowley. So without further ado, please welcome the workshop administrator, Hugh, who will introduce the room. Thank you, Felicia. Now, I am honored to introduce our current instructor and tonight's reader, Hiromi Goto. Hiromi comes to us from Vancouver, BC, where she is an instructor and writing mentor at Simon Fraser University. 
She's been a writer in residence at several universities, and this past spring, she was the guest of honor in Wisconsin. She is the author of five novels, including the multiple award-winning Chorus of Mushrooms, the Tip Tree Award winner, The Kappa Child, and the Parallax Award-winning YA novel, Half World. Her stories have appeared in multiple anthologies and magazines, and many of them are collected in the book, Hopeful Monsters. She's currently working on another adult novel and also a graphic novel, so be sure and ask her about those after the reading. In, uh, in all aspects of her career, as a writer, an instructor, and a social activist, Hiromi is an advocate for greater diversity in literature, uh, for allowing space or creating it, space for all voices to be heard and all faces to be seen. On Sunday, Hiromi introduced herself to the class as a Japanese-Canadian feminist queer mother who grew up on a farm. In her speech to Wiscon, she said that much of her writing has been formed by a keen understanding of the stories that are missing. In her own work, therefore, she paints with a palette that is rich with underheard voices and underseen faces. If you've read her work, you already know her as a brilliant illuminator of human cultures and relationships, and as the creator of worlds that mirror our own but in lights that reveal and inspire. Please join me tonight in welcoming Hiromi Goto. Thank you, Hugh, for that very generous um, introduction. It's so nice. I usually don't use a, a lectern because um, I'm short, um, but is this height okay? I could get rid of it if it's, it's fine? Okay. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to acknowledge the indigenous, indigenous peoples of this land, uh, the Duwamish Nation um, and their traditional lands. Um, I am very happy to be a guest here. And uh, I'd like to thank um, Clarion West for um, inviting me to be a, a workshop leader um, for this week. Um, it's a privilege and um, an honor, and also I, I learned just as much um, journeying with the students um, as, the, as the students learn themselves, and it's um, it enriching, and I'm very, very grateful. Um, thank you to Neil and Hugh um, and the 2014 uh, workshop cohorts for um, being so open and generous and welcoming, um, and thank you for University Books uh, Bookstore for hosting tonight's event. Um, I'm going to read a very, very new short story. Um, I haven't written short stories for a while because I spend most of my time writing book lengths, um, projects. Uh, but um, I was asked to write, it. I usually write a short story if I'm invited to uh, submit something to a, a magazine or, or an anthology. Um, and yes, they still get rejected. I'm, I'm still invited. <laughs> I've been writing for over 20 years, and I still have short stories rejected. So, you know, it just goes on and on and on. <laughs> it's just fine. Um, this one was accepted. And um, I'm a little nervous. I haven't read from it before, so bear with me. Covalent Bond. Helen Sakura Yamamoto retrieved her glass Tupperware from the staff refrigerator and peeled away the lid. A cold cloud of cooked onion rose in the warm air, the odor expanding like a fart. <laughs> Helen glanced at Menno's face as his lunch spun in slow circles, a low whir of sound filling the lunchroom corner of their floor. Luckily, hardly anyone ever used the space, choosing instead to eat in the newly renovated cafeteria or step out for the numerous fast food options in the neighborhood. So very few people had to smell the onion fart that was Helen's lunch. <laughs> Ding, your turn, Menno said. Helen could smell his reheated meal, tuna fish, tomatoes from a tin. She wondered if his mother had served it to him the previous night. He always had Sunday dinner with his mother, whether he was single or not. Helen stifled a small sigh. At least Menno had six days of his life without his mother. 
smells good, Helen whispered. Minnow shrugged. Tuna supreme. He shuffled past her to sit at the small faux wood veneer table. Again, Darren had left to run a personal errand over the lunch break, and Geraldine Lee had gone to the cafeteria for the salad bar, so Helen was alone with Menno. On the rare occasions when the four of them found themselves eating together in the lunchroom, Helen sometimes pretended that they were on a double date. The thought would make the tips of her ears burn. They stuck out through the long, thin strands of her hair, small red beacons of embarrassment, heart pounding. And maybe that's what it feels like to be in love, Helen had thought, her ears burning hotter. On those days, she could scarcely utter a word. Helen was not in love with Menno. He was eight years younger than her and looked a little like a full-bodied Steve Buscemi. <laughs> but Helen had never been in love, so pretending was enough to render her mute for several hours. When that happened, garrulous Darren and deadpan Geraldine would try to draw her out while Menno shared slightly mean but funny details about his mother's home decor, her cooking, and her ignorance about the world in general. Helen tucked her hair behind her ear. She slid the glass Tupperware into the microwave and entered two minutes on the keypad. The microwave began to whir. She stared at the food, turning slow circles beneath the orange glow of the bulb inside the oven. She and her mother would be eating leftover pork chops and onions for a few days. Helen scraped her upper lip with her bottom teeth. She had to take over all of the cooking when her mother was no longer able to continue. Her mother had been a better cook. The odor of reheated cooked onions overwhelmed Menno's tuna and tomatoes. The slightly sour tinge of old pork chops began to smell like wet shoes. It was a shame that her mother couldn't cook anymore. Helen loved her mother's dishes, and she knew her mother missed preparing them. Pork chops again? Minno asked. Heat rose from Helen's collarbone, speckling her neck with red dots to bloom upon her acne-scarred cheeks. Oh, Helen laughed nervously. I bring pork chops for lunch a lot, don't we? She dropped her chin and blinked in rapid succession. What little hunger she had was a shriveled thing in the bottom of her belly. Was Minnow a vegetarian? No, a fishitarian? <laughs> Maybe the little gray slab of dried pork chop she ate was repulsive. Maybe she was a little gray slab of old pork chop. Pork chops were so cheap, cheaper than beef or chicken breast, and it cooked up so quickly, you could pour anything on top of it, a can of cream of celery soup, tomato soup, applesauce, fried onions, if you had a little extra time. And with a handful of fresh greens and a scoop of rice, you had an entire meal ready in 20 minutes. It couldn't be helped that her mother wasn't able to do any more shopping or cooking. She was doing her duty as best she could, the only daughter of immigrant parents that there wasn't any point in wondering what things would have been like if her father hadn't died when Helen was 12. He had died, and she would never know. And now she was sort of that seven years old who had never lived with, sorry, and now she was a 37 years old woman who had always lived with her mother. A mother who, Helen ate a lot of pork chops. Ding. Helen used the two folded paper towels to carry the heated glass Tupperware. The moisture that had remained in the meat had been absorbed in the rice. Helen set the hot container on the table and sat down. She retrieved her travel chopsticks from her purse and lowered her head in gratitude for the food. She was grateful. A full belly was a privilege. Shame could suppress hunger, but it never nourished. Want to trade lunches? Minnow asked. There was a sound of a grin in his voice. Helen jerked her face upward. He was grinning, and it made him beautiful. A slow warmth spread across Helen's chest, and her eyes shone. Really? She probed. Really? Menno nodded. I'm so sick of mom's tuna supreme, I could slit my throat. <laughs> <laughs> Helen giggled. She slid her glass container across the table as Menno slid his lunch toward her. I never think to use tuna, Helen confessed. Mama thinks if we're going to eat fish, it ought to be fresh, but I don't have any confidence in cooking fish, so I just end up making more pork chops. Her, her ears burned. Menno had stabbed the stiff slice of cooked meat with a fork and bitten off a mouthful. It's a little tough, Helen said. 
Mmm, he nodded as he swallowed. The onions add extra flavor. Helen couldn't stop the smile spreading across her face. The ringtones of her cell phone punctured the lunchroom. It was 12.30 after all. What did she expect? Could she just not answer this one time? She hadn't even had one bite of Menno's tuna supreme. It would be so nice to eat someone else's food, even if it was someone else's unwanted food. She could just call her mama back after she'd finished eating. But what if something was wrong? What if her mother felt ill? What would happen if Helen scrabbled inside the jumbled contents of her purse? Hello, she gasped. What's so important in your lunchroom that you can't pick up your phone? Her mother's voice was sharper, louder than usual. Menno glanced up from his pork chop, his eyebrows raised. It was Helen's fault, of course. She shouldn't have made her mother wait those extra rings. She must have been frightened. That's why she was practically shouting. Helen slouched in her chair. Sorry, Mama, I, I couldn't find it in my bag. It gave me such a turn. You know I can't do anything for myself. The death of you would be the death of me. You know this, you of all people. I'm sorry, Mama. Menno's eyes were too wide. His, he mouthed words with exaggerated movements, and Helen didn't know what he was trying to say. She swiveled 45 degrees away from Menno's gaze and closed her eyes. You think? Helen swallowed hard. Sorry, Mama. What were you saying? What's wrong with you today? Completely witless. You'll be fired if you can't pay attention. And then where would we be? How long do you think we can live on a $10,000 line of credit and my nothing pension plan? Her mother scoffed. Do you think it's so easy to start over again? Do you think you could start a new career at your age when there's so much unemployment? You'd be lucky if they hired you at McDonald's. A dull beat throbbed inside Helen's skull. I'm sorry, I have a bit of a headache, she said in a low voice. A headache, you say, you have a headache. Well, isn't that rich? You're free to live your life as you like while I'm stuck here at the house and you have a headache. Jesus. It was Menno. Helen's lips turned downward, her eyes wide. He must be able to hear everything her mother was saying. Why don't you just hang up on her, Menno snapped. Holy smokes, I thought my mother was bad. What's that? Her mother asked. <laughs> Who's there? Who's talking to you while I'm speaking? <laughs> Mama, it's a shared lunchroom, Helen whispered. I know what a lunchroom is for heaven's sake. Helen closed her eyes. The press of tears behind her eyelids brought a swell of salt inside her mouth. She took a deep breath, shuddering with exhalation. Are you crying? What is wrong with you? You have nothing to cry about. What about me? What about my life? You say you have a headache? How do you think I feel, you ungrateful, self-centered? The line was dead. Helen, stunned, stared unblinking at the ray of beige cubicles that spread across the room. Menno plucked the cell phone from her hand and pressed down upon the power button to turn it off completely. You shouldn't listen to that, he said. She's poison. I had no idea you were speaking with your mother every day. I thought it was your boyfriend. His voice was low, protective, kind. He dropped the cell phone into the open mouth of Helen's jumbled purse. Helen swallowed hard. You hung up on her. Her voice crackled. Menno strode to the sink and filled a mug with water from the tap. He pushed the cup into Helen's hands, and she obediently raised to take a small sip. The water tasted faintly of burned coffee. You live with her, don't you? Menno asked. Helen looked down at the floor once again. Her thin hair swept forward to obscure part of her face. You shouldn't have hung up on her. It's not right for her to talk to you that way. His voice was fierce. The tips of Helen's ears burned. Hey, what we miss, Darren joshed as he and Geraldine approached the lunchroom. You know management discourages inter-office relationships. <laughs> Shut up, Darren, Geraldine whispered, punching his bicep. <clears throat> Helen grabbed her purse and clutched in both arms as if she were protecting a football. She half ran to her cubicle, abandoning her uneaten lunch on the table. 
Look what you did, Geraldine hissed. You can't say things like that to Helen. Jesus, Darren, you're such a loudmouth. Sorry, Darren raised both hands, waist level, his palms facing outward. Come back, Helen, he called out. I was just kidding. Helen, back in her cubicle, pretended she couldn't hear them. Her heart thudded inside her throat. It was ridiculous. She knew that. They could see her skinny back bent slightly over her desktop, her elbows clamped to her sides. But if she didn't acknowledge them, she could continue pretending that nothing had happened. She could hear her workmates murmuring behind her back, but all Helen could do was think about her mother. She should phone her back, but she would be so angry. Minnow was right. Her mother shouldn't speak to her like that. It, it wasn't right. It wasn't nice. Everyone deserted, deserved to be treated nicely. But her mother put up with so much too. Of, of, of course she would get impatient and angry when she was incapable of leaving the house. It's not that she didn't feel compassion for her mother, but every single day, her mother's demands, her judging eyes, her accusations and guilting and blame, since the day after her father's funeral, her mother poison had swelled and bloomed, filling their house until Helen couldn't bear it anymore, until Helen broke. She should phone her back, apologize to her mother, let her know that it was Menno who had done it, not her. Lunch over, all of the employees returned to their cubicles. The murmur of their voices as they spoke to customers through their headsets. The sound rose and fell in pitch and intensity, heaving and rolling like a great wave upon expanse of ocean. One light, then two, three flickered on Helen's office phone. Fat tears fell upon her black desk. They shone like pearls. The office floor was silent when Helen looked up from her desk. Her eyes widened with alarm and swung to the giant wall clock above the main doors. 6.15 p.m. Helen whipped her head from side to side as if she might somehow catch her lost time. After her disastrous lunch hour, she had fallen grossly behind on her day's output and had been playing a frantic yet dogged catch-up ever since. And now she was half an hour later than the time she would usually be at home. Why hadn't her mother called? Helen's heart dropped like a brick into her stomach. She hadn't turned it back on again. What if Helen plunged her hand inside her purse and grabbed her phone? She held down the switch on the top, her eyes dazed as it slowly booted up. Her heartbeat pounded inside her ears and a ringing distance ringing echoed a ghost from a call she had missed and missed and missed again. A hand swept across her desk, plucking her cell phone from her slim fingers. Helen gasped. Menno dangled her device in front of her face and jerked it away when she desperately reached to grab it. Give it back, she gasped. What are you doing? The cell phone toned its little melody, a sunny, happy tune. Helen leapt to her feet, a good four inches taller than Menno. He didn't bother holding the device up high. Instead, he tucked it into his belly, bending over so that his buttocks served as a barrier. He looked like a non-athletic junior high student trying to protect a basketball. <laughs> What is your problem, Helen cried. I have to check my messages. Something might have happened to my mother. Oh, God. Tears were dribbling down her face and mucus bubbling in her nose. She bent over, a weird heaving cry breaching her mouth. It was all over. God, oh, God. A gentle arm curled around her skinny bag. A waft of heat and moisture seeped from Menno's armpit. He smelled like a clean goat. <laughs> <laughs> don't you see? She's taken over your entire life, and you don't have to accept it. You're not obligated to care for her. Come on, you missed lunch. Let's go for a drink. You've never gone for a drink with anyone in your seven years working for this company. <coughs> Let's get a drink and something to eat, and let your mother be for one day of your goddamn life. Minnow thrust a crumpled paper napkin into her hand. Helen wiped the mucus from her upper lip, blew her nose, and dropped the sodden paper into her waste back basket. May I have my phone back, please? Minnow sighed. He placed her cell phone in her open palm. 
Helen stared at the screen. Her mother had not called back. There were no messages. Helen's face was expressionless. What did it mean? It's called respite, Minnow said. You're allowed to have time for yourself and be your own person. You can't be a caretaker all the time. Come on. He turned off her computer, computer monitor and stuck his arm through the straps of her purse, letting it dangle from his elbow as he draped her coat over her curled shoulders. The world's not going to end just because you take off for a couple of hours. If you do this once, you'll see that it's possible. Anything is possible. Helen heard Menno's voice from a great distance. Her mother had not called after she had been disconnected. From midday through the afternoon into the evening, what has her mother been thinking all this time? She would be so angry. If only it would all go away. Everything. If someone could just take it all away, please, anyone. Let her never have to feel guilt or fear or anxiety, shame. Just one drink. It'll be nice. You'll see, Menno said. Okay. Helen's eyes widened. Has she actually spoken? Where had it come from? Shocked, she said nothing as Menno led her to the elevators down to a night wet with rain. Helen could not say where they went. It was loud, a cushioned kind of noise that dulled Menno's features and the edges of his voice. A young waitress with long black hair and a short black skirt kept up an unobtrusive supply of sweet minty drinks and salty bits of deep fried food that gyred deep inside Helen's belly. So that was the last straw for me. Menno karate chomped with his arm, the wedge of his hand cutting through the lounge's ambient music and human roar. I was done. I moved out of the house. I started counseling. This changed my life. The cool, moisture-beaded glass felt over wet in Helen's fingers. It was her third drink, or fourth. She hadn't drunk so much alcohol since her university days, over 15 years ago. Imagine that. The glass slid through Helen's numb fingers. It crashed upon the granite tabletop, shards and ice shooting sideways into their laps. Her mother hadn't eaten since 7.30 that morning. She'd left her to starve for over 14 hours. Jesus, Menno said, are you okay? His voice wasn't as kindly as it had been. He didn't even look at her, just picked out the glinting bits of glass that speckled his trousers. The tall, cool waitress strode over with cloths and a tray. Helen grabbed her purse and coat. She walked carefully toward the exit, unaware of the glances cast upon her. Yep, Minnow called after her back. You're welcome. Don't worry, I'll take care of the bill. The sarcasm never reached Helen because by then she was running. The cab came to a silent stop in front of her mother's small bungalow. Emergency rescue vehicles with flashing lights were not parked outside their home. The neighborhood was mid midweek silent. In the distance, a dark figure walked a shadow dog. The rain had stopped, but a mist had risen from the ground. The pale wisps were hungry ghosts, endlessly searching for sustenance. Helen had already taken bills out of her wallet, and she thrust the money at the cabbie. Exiting the vehicle without stopping to shut the door, she staggered up the walk, her ankles and knees as fragile as newly hatched chicks. Mama, Mama, I'm so sorry. Salty liquid laughed at the soft wet of her throat. The keys shook in her hands so she could scarcely fit metal teeth into the slot. The deadbolt unlatched with a loud metallic clunk. Her sweaty hand clung to the cold doorknob, turned, opened the door, closing her eyes. She entered the house, silent, so still, dark. They never opened the blinds, let alone the curtains that doubled the darkness. And she hadn't come home at 5.45 as she had every single day for the past 10 years so that she could turn on the lights for her mama and feed her 
talk to her, take care of her, what kind of daughter has she turned into? Everything her mother said was true. She was self-centered and selfish, disgusting. The smell, it was bad. Helen started to shake. The oily sweetness of mint, honey, and rum clung to the inside of her mouth, and the unfamiliar foods she had eaten were a congealed lump in the bottom of her belly. She did not want to turn on the light. The Art Nouveau lily lamp her mother loved so very much. The lamp and a cell phone were kept on a small mahogany table close to her mother's side in the living room. If Helen turned on the light, she would have to see what had become of her mother. Turn on the lamp, burn the house to the ground. Helen gagged, sour grains of polenta and deep fried pickled jalapenos clotted the back of her throat. <coughs> She swallowed it back down as hot sweat seeped from her pores. Was Mama dead? Let her be dead. Let her not be dead. Let her be dead. Let her not be dead. You're late. Her mother's voice crackled across the darkness. A shuddering intake of breath, Helen's exhalation was a long sigh of relief, or perhaps regret. Helen wended through the pitch black of the living room toward her mother's favorite lamp. Even if Helen's eyes were plucked from her face, she could have found her way. She walked it so every single day for the past decade. She clicked the light on. The small bulb cast a pale orange glow to the tinted glass of the little pelvis. In the center of the largest wall in the living room, Helen had cut an irregular hole slightly larger than the circumference of a human head, about five feet above the floor. Other than the hole, nothing adorned the roughly made wall. Helen's home renovation skills were rudimentary. When she finished erecting the second wall that ran parallel to the original, she hadn't bothered to measure properly. The gap between the two walls was roughly two feet. She never bothered finishing with a baseboard it didn't really matter. They never entertained. Her mother's head had flopped forward through the hole Helen had cut from the plasterboard. Her mother's soft white hair blended into the white of the wall. She was virtually invisible. Just a blank, blank expanse, Helen could almost pretend that she hadn't encased her mother into the living room. Bring me water now, Helen jumped. I'm sorry, Mama. She stumbled to the kitchen and ran water in the sink as she retrieved a tall glass from the cupboard. Helen grabbed a disposable striped plastic straw from the cardboard box on the counter and popped it into the glass. She filled it up with cool water and hurried back to her mother's side. Helen gently curved her palm and fingers beneath her mother's jaw and raised her face upward. Deep vertical lines bisected her mother's brow, eyes closed, her face was furrowed with exhaustion, dehydration. Gummy white residue had dried in the corner of her eyes and her lips were flaked with dead skin. Helen's heart thudded in time with her conscience. Her hand shook as she raised the straw to her mother's clamped mouth and water lapped over the side of the glass. When her mama felt the edge of straw poking her lips, her eyes widened with outrage. Her mother's eyes, the whites were yellowed and crinkled as if they had lost too much moisture, and the brown irises um, were faded, but her pu pupils were hard bullets of blame. Her mother lit the straw for purchase. She puckered and drew, bringing cool water to her parched mouth. She swallowed and swallowed, her throat glugging over loud in the quiet room. When she had enough, she pushed the straw out of her mouth with her tongue, took a deep breath, sighed, burped, sighed once more. Helen placed the glass on a small mahogany table. I'm so sorry, Mama, she whispered. I don't know what, get the wet glass off the table, her mother snapped. You'll damage the wood. I'm sorry, Helen said. She raised the glass and wiped the droplets of water off the wood with the sleeve of her coat. Use a cloth, a cloth. Would you like some more water, Mama? No, 
get my supper. I've been starving all night because you didn't come home and me with no way of getting hold of you. Why didn't you call me? Helen asked. Idiot! Can't you see? Helen looked about. On the floor, near to where her mother was placed in the wall, was her headset. Helen crouched down to retrieve it. It fell off. Genius, utter genius. The plug from the headset was still inserted in her mother's cell phone, the cell phone glued permanently to the mahogany table. I swear it wasn't me who hung up on you, Helen said. It was one of my workmates. So you let him listen to what I said, making fun of me, laughing. No, Mama, Helen begged. He just overheard be because you were shouting. You're blaming me. You're blaming me. Helen's eyes filled with shame. Shame filled the back of her throat, sour as vomit, burning. You're right, Mama. I'm sorry. It's all my fault. And don't you forget it, because I never can. Can I? Her mother's face quivered. Her eyes were black pits. A scritching, scratching sound from behind the plasterboard. Her mother's long yellow fingernails, twisted and cracked, crept up through the hole in the wall, and she curled her bony fingers over the edge, gripping tightly. Only room enough for her face and her curled over fingers, her grotesque digits were like the withered sepals of a monster flower. I'll warm your supper, Helen said in a low voice. She would get a warm cloth to wipe her mother's eyes and face. Maybe she could finally convince her to cut her fingernails. Cut my meat smaller than last time. Are you trying to choke me to death so you can call it an accident? Would you like some hot tea first? Helen asked. I'm hungry, not thirsty. I'm starving. Of course you are, Helen said. I'm sorry. Stop apologizing. I can't believe I gave birth to you. You were probably switched at the hospital. Somewhere else, my real daughter is living a full and wonderful life, the pride of her unreal mother, while I'm stuck here with you. For the love of God, hurry up and heat my supper. Something warm dropped, one, two, on the back of her hand. The warmth quickly turned to cool. Helen dragged the heel of her opposite hand across her wet eyes. Mama, she said. Mama, why do we do this? Her mother did not answer. Helen shuffled toward the kitchen to heat her mother's late dinner. She mustn't have heard her, and it was just as well, Helen thought. She did not want to know. A weird, throttled croaking followed Helen as she left the room, a sound she'd never heard before. You stupid child, her mother's voice rasped. I love you. like a horrible story. <laughs> um, it's not me and my daughter, nor is it me and my mom. Just FYI. Um, at a conversation yesterday um, with some of the workshop members um, talking about diversity and um, representation in stories um, and I was saying how I was explaining I was actually found it very difficult to write this story um, because I don't think that there's enough positive depictions of um, characters of color um, minority characters uh, diverse characters in published fiction so it's actually quite I found it very challenging to write a story of kind of horrible people um, and you know, this is—I consider this a, a horror story. Um, um, I don't know. I, I hope most people do. <laughs> There's something wrong if you don't. It's like, oh, that's like home. <laughs> um, but in some ways, it is kind of like home too. Like sort of the sort of the contortions and the twistiness that we find within our own most intimate relationships. 
um, kind of skirts the edges of, of horror. Um, and in fiction, you can kind of balloon those moments um, into something that's a, a little bit more extreme, um, just to explore that sense of uneasiness. Um, and horror allows you to do that. So, you know, I mean, it's important for me that I try to bring a very um, sort of empowering images of, of women and women of color in fiction and queer women in fiction who, who are like bold and strong and struggle and, and then have happy endings. Um, but then there's also, I think, a place for um, mourning, <coughs> grief, um, horror, disgust, um, all of the range of, of human emotions that we have. Um, and so of that, from that, um, this story arose. And also, uh, it was um, when I was in first year university, um, I went to a, a univers the university bookstore. Um, I was looking for my books, but then also browsing um, all the shelves and just um, sort of that random, random um, purveying, purveying of books, um, much in the same way that the way I treat Google now, where you just kind of run into things and look at it and read it. Um, so, you know, that's what bookstores are like before Google um, can leave your house and do it, touch things. Um, so, I randomly came across this book called um, Knots by R.D. Lang. Um, and it was um, really, there were these really short, it's, it, it's almost poetry, um, but he's a, um, a psychoanalyst and um, He'd written sort of these very short little um, poems slash vignettes of um, really messed up family dynamics. Um, and when I read them, I was just like, you know, kind of blown away thinking this is, yeah, this is like that, the really weird, twisty shit that goes down in family um, where you're fiercely, fiercely connected and love and feel the most extreme loathing and disgust and hate. Um, at the same time, deep loyalty, um, and it's just so fucked up. <laughs> um, so you know, it's it it, it was a, a story that's sort of been in brewing for a, a while, um, and yeah, it was a lot of fun writing. Well, not fun. I was kind of <laughs> actually would feel disgust um, writing it as well um, because it's. It, it, I and I think I probably ought to feel disgust writing it, um, but yeah. I'm happy to take, I, I don't usually write stories like this, this is a little bit different of, from my usual um, material, but I'd be happy to take questions. What yeah. market book is that for? Uh, hopefully not Bride or New Children, New Mothers magazine. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's in um, a literary magazine in Canada called Room, um, R-O-O-M, and um, it's a a, magazine, a literary journal f uh, for uh, written by women. Um, yeah, written by women. So, okay. I have a world building question. What's your story? <laughs> so, uh, uh, when you were describing the living room, so like there's like a plaster wall. Like, how is her mom oriented in the room? I was having trouble That's, picturing it. Ah, uh, so it's a fail. <laughs> no, I think, I think, I think it's because it, you're reading it aloud. Like, I can't go yeah. back and, and reread things. So it's just like a wall. Parallel really to is. another wall. That's what I thought. Yeah. So she's just standing up in the wall? Yeah. That's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. Yeah. I was like, that can't be right. <laughs> okay, thank you. No, it's it's gross. When I like, when I thought of it, it was like, you're so disgusting. <laughs> it's horrible. Like it was it feels horrible to do this to the characters too. Um, and yeah, I hope uh, the spirits don't get to me for doing like that shit <laughs> <page. laughs> May I be forgiven. Um, I'm going to kind of ask kind of a flat question, but why? Why? Why was she in tune in the wall? Why was she in, in, in tuned in, in, in the wall? Yeah, um, yeah she, the, the daughter just had enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but she couldn't <coughs> kill her. So it's the idea of covalent bond, right? So covalent bond is uh, two atoms sharing an electron. So they can't split apart. So it's, it's that kind of codependent, entwined, enmeshed relationship, really, really gone bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was a cask of Amontillado involved at any point? <laughs> <laughs>
Um, it's funny you should bring that up. Um, I had it, I read it, but I was not thinking of it as um, a reference or touchstone. But then after um, my um, ex-girlfriend edited it for me, um, she said, you out po po <laughs> <laughs> So then I was like, oh yeah, there was that story. But so it wasn't a conscious um, retrieval of that or uh, a, a conscious conscious allusion to that but yeah but after in uh, you know it, afterwards I reread it and I'm like oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's read them together back to back yeah. how did you spell Menno? it's M-E-N-N-O um, it's, a, mm, it's a Dutch name um, yeah when I was my one of my sister lives in the Netherlands and um, one of her uh, friends names Menno and then I in my head, I was thinking M I N N O W. I was like, oh, that's a nice name. It's a nice name, but it was M E N N O. So, what's the, um, what are the two other projects? That yeah, um, so I have a, um, an adult novel that um, it's been sort of on the extreme slow cooker. Um, yeah. And it's it's still kind of percolating. Um, I think we could call it stalled, um, <laughs> but um, that one is uh, it's again working with sort of the idea of um, the uncanny and the horrific. Um, and um, in that novel, um, uh, oh, the main character is an, an older woman, and. Um, her husband um, turns into a woodlouse. <laughs> um, so yeah, but the, that one's kind of stalled. Um, and I've also just recently completed a, a draft of a graphic novel. Yeah. Can you talk? Are you allowed to talk about the graphic novel project yet? Or? Um, it's being shopped. So like, it's like knock on wood. Yeah. Um, it's being shopped right now. Um, but it was. Uh, a joy to write um, because you, you know in writing fiction it's there's so much time spent describing the world all the showing that goes on the page in order to set up the scene um, and the action etc but you know in writing the um, graphic novel and I've, I've written two two different manuscripts um, one is very rough and that one's not being shot um, it still needs work um, but if I felt it very liberating because um, the story is far more streamlined um, into um, characters, dialogue, uh, action, and then sort of stage directions around setting. Um, and it was kind of, if I felt like I was sprinting rather than um, running a marathon or something. Um, and it felt really liberating. So I really enjoyed the process. I'd really recommend everyone to try it too as a form. Um, yeah. And just stuck on the image of not being able to persuade your mother to cut her fingernails. <laughs> <laughs> she, I was impressed by the voices in those, and I was trying to think, would I hear, hear them as well if I was reading it on the page? And also wondered, because I don't know, have you, uh, have, do you have a dramatic background? Or is that just... No. I, I think of myself as like the Captain Kirk of authors. <laughs> um, I actually think it's, it probably comes from... I don't have um, training in, um, in, in drama or theater. Um, but I think it might be, you know, part of it would be was um, developed through reading books to my children and doing voices. Um, so, you know, I would like dramatize the stories for them. And so you know, this is basically grown-up story time, um, and I do think that tipping the, the reading towards more a performative, um, performative uh, um, rendering of it um, makes it more dramatic, um, rather than sort of the, the very flat reading, um, which some people do really well. It depends upon the content as well, I think, too. Um, but yeah, I mean, with inflection, inflecting the voice and stuff, 
you can sort of bring another level of, of emotions um, to the story um, and, the, and sort of the, the sharing of the story in this kind of performative space. So, um, They're completely believable. <laughs> Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. I always wonder where Grindel's mother is. <laughs> also, so this isn't really a question, but I just I really love the sort of white knighting self-absorption of the Meadow character. Like it rang. It's very easy to demonize a character like that, but I thought it, they really rang incredibly true. Like you pushed it just enough. Yeah, like he's not like a horrible person, and he actually did care. And then after a while, he cared less, and you know. It's just, <laughs> Yeah, just like uh, yeah, sort of the the nuances and the 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 shifts in in relationships with people and the way yeah, it's, it's I just I would love sort of exploring that on the page and then sort of catching the small gestures of it. Um, yeah, it's just a thrill. The pacing of all of it was great. It worked. Oh, thank you. I was, I was thinking, what if the has of that moment, there's that moment where like you're watching a horror movie or something and then you start laughing? <laughs> and I was like, oh, how am I going to deal with that? I was like, oh, whatever. Because <laughs> there's a moment too when horror becomes, um, we start laughing at it. And it's a very natural response too. So. I was supposed to know at the end of the noise that the mother is making is laughing or crying or something. Um, I think it's left slightly ambiguous, like just because it's all, I think it's all those things because everything is just so mixed up. Um, yeah. So, what kind of stories do you like to write? Pardon me? What kind of stories do you like to write? Um, well, I, I enjoyed writing this. I mean, enjoyed is a weird word for a story like this, but. Um, <laughs> I think there's something very cathartic about exploring those kinds of difficult places, um, and there's if I if I explore those kinds of um, more twisty places creatively, then I needn't do it in my personal life. <laughs> Not that I would ever wall up my very delightful mother in the wall. Um, and, and that's the other thing, too, is that the wall is also symbolic because it's plasterboard, right? It, it's, it's not that sturdy. Um, and so it, that's even more messed up. She's a, slightly agreeing to be there. It, yeah, it's, it's just kind of really gross. Um, so exploring those sort of like, tw the, those sort of really intense, twisty um, relational things between humans, between loved ones, um, Exploring those um, on the page, um, I, I, it's not therapy, but I, I I can go down there and then I can come back out again, um, and there's a kind of learning to be had there, um, and also a kind of acceptance. I think it's when we don't um, look at that face that we have, uh, the other face. I, I think that's when it's dangerous, um, and you know the whole you snap and something terrible happens. Um, so. Yeah, I, I, I find this kind of um, this kind of thing cathartic and interesting, challenging, um, and also yeah, it's it, like creative, creatively and also emotionally, psychologically challenging too, um, because I immerse myself in the stories, um, and then I have to come back out again. Um, so, but music is really good to take me out of these places um, too, but. Yeah, I, I mean, just also, th there's a kind of um, creative thrill in creating a particular kind of mood, like to be able to sustain that. So it's this kind of, you're kind of, you know, creating this bubble world with words um, on the page. And so it's, and it's very um, fragile. It, it could pop at any time. Um, so there's a kind of a thrill to, to be making that form for as long as it can hold, and then deciding, okay, so this is the point where I can take this story and stop enlarging it. So if it goes any larger than this, it will pop. Um, so then you have to stop there. So uh, you know that kind of um, technical playing with language and idea 
and testing how far or how how small it has to be. Um, it, it's a, it's a it's a joy to to work with form. Hey folks, I just want to jump in and say that if you would put off your book purchase uh, opportunity until the last minute, it has arrived. <laughs> <laughs>